and they're off to the races. Good morning. He is risen. I'm sorry, he's risen. One more time, he is risen. Yes, he is. He is risen, and things will never, ever be the same. Um, again, welcome to uh, Crossroads uh, this morning, Easter Sunday, April the 4th, 2020, and uh, welcome online persons. And again, we're here to celebrate that Jesus um, overcame sin, overcame death for anyone and everyone. And, uh, and so we're going to get into some of the details. And that was entirely unexpected, which is consistent with the series that we've been going through, Unexpected Jesus, where we've talked about how Jesus had this way of coming alongside people when they least expected it, and then was completely not what they expected because of the love and the power and the grace and the truth that he exhibited. The scriptures describe that Jesus came from the Father, God became a human being, and it says, full of grace and full of truth. And that's how we interacted with every human person, one-on-one, -on -one, in groups or in large crowds. He was full of grace and truth, and it just poured out to people. And again, people were never quite the same. As I mentioned, it was entirely unexpected. The disciples did not expect Jesus to rise from the grave. Remember, Good Friday was a terrible, horrible experience for them. Good Friday was about blood. Good Friday was about suffering. Good Friday was about pain and trauma and injustice and failure, humiliation, his humiliation on the cross, their humiliation in doing nothing about it, separation. They'd been with him, they'd experienced his life for quite a long period of time, two, three years, and now were separated. Separation in terms of Jesus as he hung on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me because of human sin upon him he was completely for the first time separated from the presence of the father good friday is about guilt and shame and shattered dreams as we look into the story this morning and the accounts of what happened on that resurrection sunday and there are four of them and they all have a different view a different viewpoint but they're all talking about the same thing and emphasize different details, we'll be continuing in John looking at his point of view. But again, they were not expecting this. Their dreams were shattered. They were devastated. And we're meant to, as we look in the scriptures, we're meant to see Jesus, of course, and who he is and what he's like and how we interact. But we're meant to see ourselves as well. And so this morning, whether we're here in this room or whether we're online, I ask you also to consider dreams that you've had that were shattered or that have been shattered recently or a long time ago. Because the disciples had dreams that Jesus would make things new and do away with injustice and oppression and that their lives and other lives would be better. Yet there he was hanging broken and looking ineffectual on a cross. Their dreams were shattered. And so we're meant to identify with the disciples' shattered dreams as well and see what God does with shattered dreams. Again, Good Friday is about crucifixion and death. Sunday morning was unexpected. Not by those who knew the scriptures well, not by Jesus, but unexpected and improbable. Sunday is about reunion. Sunday is about justice, reunited with the one who was good. Justice in that he is risen and did, who did not deserve to die. It's about healing. It's about the presence of God in Christ. It's about the peace of God available and demonstrated in Christ. It's about the power of God that can be released in human lives through Christ. It's about victory over sin and death. It's about forgiveness. It's about a certain hope. If Good Friday is about crucifixion and death, Resurrection Sunday morning is about brand new life. And remember where we left on Friday night, the scriptures talk about how that for the joy that was set before Jesus, he endured the cross, 
and scorned its shame and rose and sat at the right hand of the Father. The joy set before him was the joy of human beings being able to be reconciled back into a loving, intimate, close, powerful relationship with God, accomplished through his crucifixion and rose. That's the joy that was set before him that enabled him to endure. It was love that powered him through the whole wretched ordeal on our behalf. So that's what we celebrate. We celebrate that amazing love and that amazing accomplishment that Jesus accomplished for anyone who would trust and believe in what he had done. And so this morning, we're going to continue on about fearful, because when they woke up that morning, they were devastated, they were fearful, they were shut up. You know how when you experience a traumatic and painful experience, great disappointment, we as human beings can have a tendency to just shut down. It's how we survive. It's a way of self-protection. The disciples were certainly in that mode. The scriptures describe it. If you've ever been deeply disappointed or hurt or pained, you understand. Jesus' resurrection shows and offers victory over sin and death. And so, in John chapter 20, that's where we'll spend most of our time this morning. In the first chapter, it mentions that early in the morning on the first day of the week, first day of week, their week would be our equivalent of Sunday. It actually was Saturday on the calendar, but on the first day of the week, after the day of rest, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. And then more details that follow. All the different Gospels describe how the stone was removed, and it was women that discovered it first. Whether it was Mary, John emphasizes Mary Magdalene alone, who Jesus had delivered. But some of the other accounts mentioned there was Mary Magdalene and others. But it was the women that discovered that Jesus had risen from the dead. And they went back and they told the men, and the men didn't believe them at first because nobody expected this and they didn't necessarily take their testimony as valid. Luke describes in Luke 24, verse 5 through 6, is why when the women were at the tomb or around the tomb, angels spoke to them and said, why do you look for the living among the dead? They came to bring spices and burial implements to make sure that his body was completely prepared according to the custom for burial. That was one of the jobs that women did. There wasn't funeral homes and things like that to take care of that. It was the women that did that. And so why do you look for the living among the dead? He has risen. And so the rest of the time this morning... We're going to be looking in a little further into John chapter 20, where it describes later on in that day. We saw in the video that there was a point where Peter and John ran to the tomb. John was younger and probably faster. He got there first, but John was more timid and he didn't go in the tomb. Peter finally got there and went right in, as is his bold personality. And then John went in and they discovered and saw for themselves. Later on in the day, and that's where we'll pick up. And in this, in this text, we're going to look largely, we're going to be three important takeaways that we can apply to our lives right now. And so would you join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the heart of the message. Lord, thank you that you did rise from the grave. Thank you that you did conquer sin and death, and that sin and death do not have the last word. Lord, we'll say it again. Sin and death do not have to have the last word in our lives because you've conquered sin and death. And you want to make that victory available to all. That it would reside and live and pulsate in our lives, in our everyday lives. And then one day, when our physical bodies wear out, they take us into eternity with you. Lord, thank you that you know us better than we know ourselves. And you love us better than we love ourselves. And again, you are the one full of grace and truth. And so we ask that you'd speak by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak through your living and active scriptures, and Lord, that you would engage us in a way that's meaningful and significant in where we and how we need to be engaged. And that's what's so great about you. You have an amazing track record of coming alongside and meeting us where we're at, human beings where they're at, and leading us forward. Lead us now, Lord. Speak to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're later that morning. We're in verse 19 of chapter 20. 
and follow along with me. I think it's on the screen behind me. On the evening of that first day of the week, again, this is Resurrection Day, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked because of fear of the Jewish leaders. Remember, the Jewish leaders were the one behind the crucifixion and got the Romans to do it. And if they could crucify Jesus, the leader of this movement, they certainly could crucify and would be considering crucifying his followers in order to do away with this movement that was shaking up the status quo. And so on that evening, they were together, but the scriptures is very clear, the doors were locked because they were afraid. They'd been through an incredible trauma. They were shuttered down for self-protection, trying to process what was going on in their soul, but also afraid that they might come for them at any moment. And in that circumstance of being fearful and locked up and hunkered down, Jesus came and stood among them. There's no explanation for how all of a sudden he was there. The doors were locked, but all of a sudden Jesus was there. And he came and stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. And he'll say this two more times that evening. He said, Peace be with you as he stood amongst them. And after he said this, he showed them his hands. And he showed them his side. And the disciples were overjoyed that they saw the Lord. It had to be stunning and shocking to them. First of all, to see him. And maybe they thought they were seeing things or disoriented, but then there was unmistakable when he looked at them, present in their presence, and said, See? It's me. Takeaway for you and I from this portion, and there's going to be three takeaways. The takeaway for you and I is that we can and we should release our unrest to his presence that gives peace. The disciples were definitely not in a state of rest. As we mentioned, they were traumatized, they were disoriented, their dreams were shattered. They had seen the grisly death of their favorite person in the world that they'd followed for two or three years. They were greatly disturbed in their souls, and then Jesus stood in their midst. And so the takeaway for us is, whatever unrest we might be experiencing right now, whatever unrest we might experience next week at work, in our personal lives, in our public lives, in our financial, in our health and well-being, in any area of life, whenever unrest wants to just knock us off our feet and get us to hunker down and shut down in fear, Remember his presence. He stood in their midst and his focus was, it's really me. I'm here. I know you think I'm not, but I'm here showing them his hands and his side. And so we need to remember to release our unrest to his presence. And this presence gives peace. Remember the first thing that he said, peace be with you. My peace be with you. See, it's me. I am present so often. You know, we can at times live in a very fractured and fragmented culture and loneliness and feeling like no one understands and I'm alone in this world is a very common human experience these days. It doesn't have to be. If we will remember that he rose from the grave and that when whatever circumstance we are in, he can and is and will be present if we focus on that. Release our unrest to his presence that gives peace. Continuing on in verse 21, again, John describes it again. Jesus said, peace be with you. This is now the second time. He said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. Let's back up a little bit. Again, second time. Peace be with you, understanding their unrest. He says, as the Father has sent me, I came from the Father. I was sent to bring life into the world, to bring good news, to bring forgiveness into the world. I was sent, and I came willingly and voluntarily out of the love I have for you, and out of the joy of having human beings reconciled back into a relationship with God. 
The Father sent me, and as the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. You are experiencing me now. You have experienced me. Now I'm sending you into the world to be a demonstration of my love and the Father's love. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And then he says something that's a little shocking and can be misconstrued. He says, if you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they're not forgiven. What's Jesus saying here? Say, as I was sent to demonstrate the love and the forgiveness and the power of the Father and the grace and truth of the Father, so now I'm sending you. And one of the most tangible ways to demonstrate the reality of God as a human person to another human person is to be a forgiving person, is to forgive others. To not be focused on critiquing others all the time or pointing out all their faults or shortcomings and standing at a certain aloof distance looking down our nose and saying, you know what, you're not very good at that, are you? You fall short here, don't you? If you forgive anyone their sins, they're forgiven. You're demonstrating the forgiving love of the Father. See, that's one of the interesting things about being a follower of Jesus Christ and forgiving the forgiveness and the grace of Jesus. It is incumbent upon me, it is incumbent upon you, it's incumbent upon all of us to manifest and demonstrate that same pursuing love, graciousness, and forgiveness toward others because we have received so much. Oftentimes we have such short memories about how much God has forgiven us or continues to forgive us for the ways that we fall short, for the sins and the selfishness that we commit or the opportunities to be generous and kind that we walk away from. But we're really good at zeroing in on the faults of others. It's an ugliness that Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection was meant to remove its power in our life. And so the takeaway for us here is receive his peace. Remember he said, my peace, peace be with you. Receive his peace in order to share and extend his forgiveness. It is very important to stay in touch with the forgiving grace of God. It's not like... Here's an example. Here's an example. Anyone ever book a hotel room or anything online? Anybody ever use Airbnb and, and book a, a stay or whatever in Airbnb? Any, any hands for that? Okay, that's a relatively new thing for us. You know, we've, we've booked, ho, you know, motels and hotels online by the scads. But Airbnb, we've only done that a few times. And so recently we were getting ready to reserve a spot. And, uh, and so it was an interesting thing happened. So you, know, you get on the Airbnb website and you see what you like and you pick your days and then you say, okay, we, we, we like this, we want it. And was rather surprised when you hit the send button or whatever and it says, um, okay, waiting, the host has 24 hours to decide whether or not he or she wants to accept it. Which that doesn't happen with a hotel. Hotel, it's, 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 it's within a few seconds. And so I was like, well, this is odd. Okay, whatever. And within 10 minutes or so, it came back. Um, because you're not a registered Airbnb person, um, I, I'm not going to rent to you. It was like, oh. And, and I remember being put off by that. You know, and, and one of the thoughts was, well, you know, you should know that we're responsible people. You should know that we pay our bills and don't destroy things. And, and then a note came back from the person. And the person said, um, I want you to know that I, I need confirmation through Airbnb because of my property and my neighbors. I've made a commitment to my neighbors that who comes into my place, you know, will be reliable and there are not going to be a detriment. 
And so I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, we, we reserved, you know, because we had reserved an Airbnb years ago, and I'd done it, but this time Laura tried to make the reservation. So I was like, okay, Laura types in a message. Um, well, you know, we've been on Airbnb before, but, you know, I, I didn't log into our account, and my husband will get in touch with you. And so I find our account, and I send him the, the two times that we've been at an Airbnb. And we got good ratings because they, you can rate the people that stay in your place. And we got a good rating. And I also wrote him a little note about who we are and why we'd like to stay at his place. Within 10 minutes, came back, confirmed. Here's the thing. He needed confirmation, credible confirmation, from his source, from a source that was reliable and credible to him, that this was going to be okay for his property, for his life, for his neighbors, that it wasn't going to be a detriment. Jesus said, my peace I give you. Here's my Holy Spirit. Now you go and forgive. And people will know that I am genuine and I am the real deal by the way you conduct yourselves. Confirmation that's credible. We are called to be Jesus' credible confirmation in the world that he will be of benefit and not destructive to people's lives, to people's friendships and connections by how we conduct ourselves. And so the question is, believers and followers of Christ, how are we conducting ourselves? Are we gracious? Are we kind? Are we forgiving and generous? Or are we generally critical and overbearing and more focused on ourselves and the benefit that we've gotten from Jesus? And lost sight of the benefit we're meant to be in the world in the name of Jesus. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? There are amazing benefits. The forgiveness of sins, the infusion of life, the resurrection life of the Holy Spirit that come through faith and trust in Jesus. And it's meant to be received, but it's sure not meant to be just kept inside and have no manifestation in the world. Because that's not confirmation that this is real. Real spiritual life is lived in the context of our relationships and responsibilities, and we are called to be gracious and truthful and kind and forgiving and generous. Receive his peace, but just like he was sent, so are we're sent to share and extend his forgiving love to the world. Got it? And when I say got it, don't hear me looking down my nose at you saying, got it? Because I'm looking at myself as well. You guys know I put my pants on one leg at a time just like you and wrestle with all the challenges of living the life that Jesus calls us to live. Okay, release our unrest to his presence. His presence gives peace and then receive this peace in order to share and extend his forgiveness to those around us. Yes! Now we get to a guy who's struggling with the pain that he's experienced and the doubt that he's experienced associated with that pain. And I love, and it's, you know, John just portrays this beautifully. Remember, they're locked up in a room. They're afraid. They've been traumatized. Their dreams are shattered. There's doubt. There's pain. There's disillusionment. And at some point, Thomas said, you know, I've had enough. I just, I just need to get out. And so Thomas is away. It's suffocating in here. I just, I just need, you know how it is. I just need to get. And that's where we pick it up in verse 24. Thomas, who's one of the twelve, says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. What we've just been describing, where he came and said, Peace be with you, and peace be with you, and, and shared his presence. Here's the nails, here's the side. I'm breathing on you and giving you the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power of the Spirit, in order that you can be forgiving, compassionate, kind, and gracious people in the world to confirm to the world that there is reality in me. Thomas wasn't there for any of that. And so John makes note of this. Verse 25, so the other disciples told him when Thomas returned, they said, we've seen the Lord, we've seen the Lord. And Thomas is like, yeah, 
right. I know what I saw. He was very, very dead. But they said, we've seen the Lord. And he said, you know what? Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger, you're saying that you, you saw nail marks. You saw a side that it had to be him. You know what? Don't just tell me, unless I put my fingers in the nail holes, unless I put my hand in the, the, the spot opened up in his side by the spear, he said, I will not believe. I don't care how passionate you are about it. I don't care how convinced you are. I know what I saw. I know the trauma that I experienced, the sounds that I heard, the smell of it. Unless I put my fingers in the nail holes, unless I put my hand in his side, I will not believe. Doubt. Skeptical. And we all know, in our own personal lives, and we've seen in others as well, how pain and trauma...